We are going to continue from the portion, the biblical portion that we saw yesterday. Glory be to the Lord forevermore. For that, we are going to open up our Bibles to 1st of Timothy, to chapter 2, verse 9. Glory to the Lord. Do we all have it? Glory to Christ. Blessed be the Lord forevermore. My soul worships you, Lord Jehovah. Praise be the name of God. Well, the word of God says, we read it in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. In like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness, and sobriety, not with broidered hair or gold or pearls or costly array. Hallelujah. My soul praises you, O Lord. Well, beloved brethren, we are going to see in continuation about the study on the topic of holiness, which we said that this day we are going to see the definitions of all these parts that we saw uh, yesterday. Blessed be the Lord. Because we also mentioned that what is written, brethren, is for us to obey so that we can reach the blessings that God wants to give us, our Heavenly Father wants to give us. And also, we need to know that in the Word, in the Scripture, we cannot go to the extreme of one way, otherwise we convert into Pharisees. And God gave it to the Pharisees because they lost what was mercy, what was the love, and what was judgment, which is like the righteousness, to judge correctly. But if we go to the other extreme, we fall short of obeying the Word of God as to what God wants us to obey. That is why we need to be in the perfect balance of the Lord, in that perfect uh, center of the will of God for our lives. So the topic we are looking at is holiness, brethren. And yesterday, when we saw what is holiness, right? We saw, and in, in brief, I'll, ex I'll explain it, what we saw. We saw holiness means separating from contamination, what is contaminated, what the Bible says is contamination, and also separating uh, is separating from sin. That also is what holiness means. And also holiness means to be separate for God exclusively for the service of the Lord. Praise be his name forevermore. We also saw how can I reach holiness? Well, holiness is is reached in two parts. When we have faith in the Word of God, sorry, that's when we have faith in the Word of God and also when we believe in what is written in the Word, in the Scripture, because when we see what is written in the Scripture, we see that it is in the blood of Jesus Christ, in that sacrifice that God, that Jesus has done for us at the cross of Calvary. And that is why now we are washed in the, with the blood of the Lamb, our guilty conscience, and we can now praise God with all of our strength, all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our being. But also we saw, and this is the part that we stayed at, um, that holiness has two aspects. It has the internal aspect and the, whole, and the external aspect. So today we're going to look at all of those parts in the Scripture. Praise be the name of God. So, let us commence here in verse, in uh, chapter 2, verse 9. And so, brethren, it is important for us to look at these studies so that we can come to know what God is speaking to us in His Word, what He wants from us, and also what happens when we put it into practice well, we win. We do not lose anything, but we win in Christ Jesus. So it says in the scripture, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, 
not with broidered hair or gold or pearls or costly array. Now, I want to emphasize on something before I commence. This isn't to attack anyone. This isn't for any of those things. But this is to give purely the teaching that God gives us in the scripture. That's it. So, it says here, when it mentions the word, modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, because this part does not just apply to the women, it also applies to men. Men need to also be cautious of that, to be in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety. So we need to investigate those three words a little bit further so we can see um, more profoundly what they mean and what God is actually speaking to us, to our lives, through the scripture. Praise be the name of the Lord. So let us go to the next slide. So we'll see here in uh, 1st of Timothy chapter 2 verse 9. We saw those three words. So let's break them down now. So that is... When we look at these three words in a dictionary, when we look at modest apparel, modest apparel comes out with different words. And we see that those words tell us and clears up what it's talking about. And it's speaking of having or showing a moderate or humble estimate of one's merits, importance, etc. We also see free from vanity egotism, boastfulness. So this is something that when you're wearing your attire, your, your clothing, whether it's a male or a female, it's got to be free from extravagance or showing off or ostentation. It's got to be uh, having or showing regard for the decencies or behavior, something that's decent, a modest neckline on a dress, for example, limited or moderate in amount or extent. So these are the things, these are the words that whenever you're going to get uh, dressed, it, it, it talks about these things. And um, as a Christian, we ask the Lord and we want to have new encounters with the Lord. So we ask the Lord and we, we basically want God to, you know, we want to feel at peace with God at the end of the day. So therefore, we're going to be wearing things that are free from vanity, free from getting attention and all those sorts of things. And when we look at uh, putting on something, we're going to be thinking in this way because we're going to be thinking what the Word of God says and we're going to think about what, how to please God. And the Word of God shows us how to please God. How can I please God? How can I continue to feel more communion with the Lord? Because each day God will give us of His mercy and each day we have much things and opportunities to glorify God. When we look at shamefacedness, we see a sense of uh, shame or honor. And we also see modesty and bashfulness, reverence, regard for others and respectfulness. It's like saying that if I put on a clothing that it's very, very uh, tight, the Holy Spirit will actually put that uh, bashfulness, that shamefulness in me saying, oh, look, this is going to show my figure. So I'm going to put something that's not so tight. So it's not going to show all of my figure when I'm out in the street or going to the church, wherever I'm going. So that's what the shamefacedness means, because it's about dressing respectfully uh, for the not just as for peers or people of their own age size, but also for people who might be younger, people who might be older, so we're to dress in a respectful manner. Because there are people that will dress in a way that they want to show off their figure. They want to show off their flesh, their color of their skin, and all of those things. And in the world, there's all these sorts of styles and ways that the uh, world dresses. If we're talking about men, there's... I'll come here so you can see me better. So there are men with styles that on one side, their pants, they'll have their trousers one side, they'll have it up onto their knee and the other side down. And they start walking around because they, it's like a gangster sort of type of style. And they want people to see them dressed like that, where one side of their leg is showing the other side is not because it's a form of rebelliousness. And there's many other styles and ways that are shameful. But in a Christian, we need to know that we must be holy because God is holy. And when we look at sobriety, 
It's a way of soundness of mind, sanity, self-control, soberness. So it talks about the way in which we dress. We are going to dress in a way that is not going to be showing all my flesh, being on too tight on me where it's going to be a way where I'm going to demonstrate my flesh or, or be of an attraction to other people, especially to somebody else who's already married. And as a holy people, we need to take that warning so we don't put things or, or be a stumbling block to somebody else or put things in to someone else's mind when they look at us. So, you know, to bring an attraction over us and things like that, because that's already speaking about some evil work in my own mind to lure somebody else and to take notice of me and to start doing something there, because that is already with a different meaning there, with the evil thought. And that's when the attacks of the enemy come. And where do the attacks of the enemy come? First to the mind. And it's more, if we love each other in Christ Jesus, that means that if I love you in Christ Jesus, then I will dress in a way that will protect your mind so that your mind is not attacked by the devil to try and cause you to see me in a different way, in a perverse way or in a, an attractive sort of manner. And just that way, I will also, you will also dress in a way so that I am not going to be focusing on those things and that the devil will have things put in my mind because that's why there are fights and jealousies and many things that can happen within a church because people don't look after themselves and how they dress. And um, this quality is needed as a Christian in order for us to dress in a way or clothe ourselves in a way where we will protect ourselves from our mind and also what we see, but at the same time that we are not a sexual object to somebody else because we are called to be a holy people before the Lord. And we're going to say before we dress, God is this of modest apparel? God is this of shamefacedness? God is this of sobriety? Is this how a Christian dresses? And when we are truly humble before the Lord, then He will teach us. He will put peace in our spirit in within. And these are things that we need to consider when we are going to clothe ourselves because our attire needs to be of a Christian man or a Christian woman. So this is how we commence to know how we should clothe ourselves as Christians. This is talking about the external part. I just wanted to show you this diagram here, but from here we're going to go to what is the internal holiness, because remember, true holiness of God in Scripture is internal and it flows on the outside. It manifests outwardly to the external, right? So we're going to continue. If you can see in this diagram here, according to um, history, how men and women uh, would dress, and we're talking about Western culture here, or the Western area, it's changed dramatically, dramatically, because everything roughly changed within the last um, 200 years, because before that, things were uh, very different. It's almost like in these last 200 years that everything has just gone astray so much and it's completely gone. So when we see there on the diagram roughly 1,400 in the year 1,400, you know, everything was roughly around the same, the styles and things of how men and women would dress. And we would see that there was a clear distinction between the one and the other as to not mix the sexes. But now things have become worse than in the 1960s, as we saw there, because now you can see out in the street how people dress with uh, showing all their body parts and things. So let's continue. All this is so that we can consider, you know why? Because we are called to be a holy people. Look, I certainly wouldn't like to be in this situation. And I'm more than sure that you would not like to, this to have happened to you. Where you're praying and you open your eyes for a little moment once you've finished or whenever and, and you find yourself with this in front. Or for a woman, finding a man in front with uh, all of his clothing very tightly put on to him, um, showing all of his body. So this is 
not just in in the church that's that's the world out there but we should not see that in the church so you can see the whole figure of the woman there and these are things that we need to um, keep ourselves from and I repeat if you love me and I love you then we will keep our holiness I will keep you in holiness and you will help to keep me in holiness by not being temptation one toward another now Let's look at some scripture and let's look at the internal holiness. Let's look at these biblical verses in Matthew chapter 12, verse 35 to 37. Praise be the Lord. Here, the word of God tells us, brethren, a good man. Now, you know what we're going to look at here about the internal holiness? Because the internal holiness manifests on the outside. It begins on the inside and goes on the outside. We're going to look at our words now. Because God wants us to be holy in our vocabulary, in our words. Because you can hear sometimes people that, you know, may, may be in a church and they're still speaking swear words. They're still speaking things that are not convenient as Christians because they have not sanctified their tongues. And we need to sanctify our tongues, brethren. And who helps us do that? God. That's why when we submit to God, then he will help us in all of these areas in our vocabulary that God will help us. It's not that I'm going to come here and teach you this, brethren, is the um, holy vocabulary. No, I would say instead, get into fasting and in prayer, be humble and sincere before the Lord and he will teach you and he will teach you things that you need to know for yourself. And God is still teaching me things too along the way. So. This is what God wants from us. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. Where does he bring him out from? Out of his heart, out of the interior, out of truly what that person is. Verse 36. But I say unto you, that's Jesus talking to us. I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. And that's not Brother Josh saying that. That is the scripture. That is Jesus Christ who said these words, telling us of the condition of idle words. And that even means that doesn't matter even if it's a, a if it may not be a swear word, but if it's a word that is an idle word, a word that does not edify my brethren, a word that does not bring into nothing because I just spoke it, because it's just a joke, just to fill in the gaps in a conversation. But in that, if there is anything that's idle, non for edification, and, and when we're talking about things that, you know, specifically when people make jokes of perverseness and all that sort of thing, then God says we will need to be accountable for that. We will be accountable for that. Verse 37, For by thy words, by your words, you shall be justified, and by your words you shall be condemned. Look how tremendous that is. So, Pastor Josh, are you condemning me? No, I'm not condemning anyone. This is the word of God. This is the scripture. This is Jesus, what he said, that we will speak out of the abundance of what's in our heart. If we speak what is good, it's because we've got a heart that is inclined unto the Lord. But if we speak evil or bad things, then it means that we need to check ourselves and come right before God because we've got something wrong with us. And God is either saying either we will be justified before him or we will be condemned before him. So holiness is important in all areas. Now let's continue. Let's look at our actions. We've seen our words. Now let's look at our actions because the actions are also manifest from what is on the inside, manifest on the outside. When we go to the scripture, it says to us in John chapter 3, verse 20 to 21. And we read the scripture. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. Look, doeth is the actions so those that doeth evil hateth the light. Who is the light? Jesus Christ. And it's saying that those who do evil hate the light and neither cometh to the light. They don't want to come to Jesus lest their deeds, their evil deeds, their evil actions should be reproved. 
You know, because when somebody is practicing sin, sin is shameful and they want to be in darkness. They don't want anybody to find out about it because they want to maintain themselves in darkness because they know that if they come to the light, the light will discover those things. And when they are discovered, well, they need to it becomes manifest and they will be reproved. They will be corrected. They will be rebuked for that. And God wants to correct us because we cannot go to heaven in that condition that we are in. And so that's why God has to rebuke us, reprove us so that we can repent from those things and become better and by not doing those things. And therefore, that way we can receive the blessing that God wants to give us. And so we can get to the end, which is eternal life. Verse 21, but he that doeth truth cometh to the light. Those who are sincere and say, yes, I recognize that I have done wrong. I am a sinner. Jesus Christ is the light. He can uh, truly set me free. He can make me make me different. He can change me. And they come to him because that's why many people, because they don't want to come to the light, they're suffering from anxiety, PTSD, and all other sorts of things that are tormenting them that they can't even sleep at nighttime because their conscience is filled with so much things that are tormenting them day and night. And therefore, those those who are of the light come to the light. And even though it's shameful, but we say, God, but you have the healing that I need for my soul. And those who practice the light or do the truth come to the light that his deeds may be made manifest that they are wrought in God. Who changed me? Jesus Christ. Glory be to his name. Praise be God. That's what God does. So our actions, beloved brethren, need to be sanctified in Christ Jesus. And how is that? How is that? The actions. Let's look at what the works or the actions of the flesh are. Now, we've seen these. Let's go to Galatians chapter 5. Let's have a look. Verse 19 to 21. Now, the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. These are things that people practice evil things. They are evil works. Verse 20, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, which is contentions, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. These are actions that people do or things that people will say. They might say, I hate you. I, uh, they're manifesting what is in their heart. And we see that Jesus said every idle word, we will have to give an account for that. And also for our actions. Verse 21, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revilings, and such like. You see, such like. So there's a long list of this, of the which I tell you before. As I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things, those who practice these things, look, we are being reproved about this because this helps us to remain in Christ. And it says that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Those who practice these evil things, these actions, they will not inherit the kingdom of God because these are sins. And that is the only way we can get to God, by separating from sin and remaining separate from sin. That's holiness. And because Christ is our hope, Christ wants to bless us along the way. He wants our faith to grow. He wants our hope to grow. And so we've seen there the works, actions that someone does or could do, but is not correct to do. But now let's look at this other part. Now, somebody might say in this one, oh, but... Brother Josh, this is a bit much, but let's look at our thoughts. Glory to God. Our thoughts need to be sanctified in Christ Jesus. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 23. Now things are getting harder, you see, because our mind is the battlefield. But you know what? Glory be to Christ Jesus because he has renewed us. It says, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. To be renewed means that Jesus, God, does that work through the Holy Spirit, even in our minds. The spirit of our mind being renewed, because there are people that in their mind, they're always thinking evil. 
They're always thinking something bad or something negative. Have you seen people that don't trust anything, anyone at all? And all their life, they may have been somebody that might have been raised on the streets or something. And uh, they had to learn how to live in the street by lying and stealing and, um, and uh, deception and many things. So they will always, they're always looking at people with, with uh, untrust. And in their mind, they're always like thinking, I've got to think a step ahead. But the Bible tells us to be renewed in the spirit, in the human spirit of our mind. Because we need to be conscious of what spirit we are acting in. What spirit are we thinking in? And many times we are doing things, we're planning and plotting things in our mind that should not be done. Things that we are prolonging those thoughts in our mind where we should not have them there. And we need to rebuke those evil things out of our mind in the name of Jesus. But the word of God says to us, renewed in the spirit of your mind. And also Romans, when we look at Romans 8, 5, we see there it says, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. So they're thinking about those fleshly things. They're thinking about the fleshly. So those who are in the flesh and not in the spirit of God are going to think more of how to please their desires of the flesh. But they that are after the spirit, that is those who value that the spirit of God dwells in their, in their heart. Those who are always wanting to have more experiences with the Holy Spirit. Those who want to glorify God and praise Him and uphold His word every day and see His glory and power and His promises in our lives. Those are the spiritual people, those who walk in obedience to God into his, to his uh, the, the scripture but they that are after the spirit the things of the spirit so they're always thinking they're always mindful of god's things of how to please god but those who are of the flesh do mind the things of the flesh so they're not going to think about god's things whether their actions have pleased god or whether where they're going to go is going to please god or if they hang if they if they accompanied with people or they they're associating with people that if it's going to please God or not. Those who are not of the spirit will do what they want and they will they will basically not even think about God, about what God wants. But those who are spiritual will say, look, I feel like I want to go, but what would God say about this? How will my communion with God be after this if I go to this other place? So that's the spiritual man that they will think about their intimate communion with God and they would not want anything to break that connection with God. We wouldn't want to um, cause that the spirit of the living God is um, saddened within us. But how can we look at all of this? Let's, let's uh, go to Matthew chapter 26, 41. How can we sanctify our thoughts? Look, it says in Matthew chapter 26, verse 41, Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. This is because temptations come to our mind. That's where it begins. And from our mind, it flows onto our emotions. And then our emotions start to get attracted to those things that are tempting us. And we start to see it in different eyes than before. Just like how Eve, she would know that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was there. But God had given them commandment that they would not eat of the fruit of that tree. But when the devil spoke with her and deceived her, manipulated her, he made her see it by her listening to him as well. She then saw that tree with different eyes and she basically being deceived, she desired to eat the fruit, extended her hand and ate and sinned. So it says, watch and pray. Why? Because when we pray, we protect that connection, that communion with God. But when it says watch, imagine this. When, you, when it says watch, you need to watch with your eyes of your mind. If you close your eyes, you're still seeing something. What are you seeing? What you're imagining. There you are watching something. But now God says to you, watch. What do you need to watch? What's going on in your mind? Those uh, movie scenes that might be going on in there or those thoughts of the past or things that might be flowing through. And what's not of God, cast it out in the name of Jesus. How will I cast it out? But it's, it's overpowering. Well, get into prayer. 
That's why Jesus said, watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. That means that when I see that something there is not according to the word, I'm not going to give it time. I'm going to cast it out in the name of Jesus. That needs to come out. Because if I leave it long lingering there, then that is how people start to fall and give in to sin. Because the devil brings it into the mind, then starts to manipulate into our emotions and starts to attract and draw us into the sin. Now he's gaining more strength because now it's in my mind the whole day and now it's in my dreams. And now when I wake up, my emotions are being drawn to it and my, my human will, my free given will is weakening. Because if there's no prayer and I'm not watching, then that's why Jesus said, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. That is why we need to submit this flesh, the desires of the flesh. We need to submit it. The carnal desires, those things that want to lead us to the fleshly things, the worldly things. Let's continue. So now we've seen that we need to sanctify these three parts of our interior, our words, our actions, our thoughts. Now let's look at this other part. When somebody is spiritual and walking in the spirit, let's look at what fruits they give. What actions do they give? How do they think? What words they say? Let's look at what this says. This is what someone who has the spirit of God inside them will produce. Someone who thinks about the Lord. Someone who thinks about pleasing God more than themselves. They begin to give the fruit of the Spirit, such as this. Galatians 5.22 But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, which is temperance is the same as self-control. And that's why many people fall in the traps of the devil, because they don't have self-control. They need that fruit of the Spirit. And... They need to spend that time in prayer, in the word of God, in the scripture, and they need to seek the Lord with all their heart. They need to ask God. They need to wait on him. They need to have that patience, the long suffering. May God help us because we are still in this in this uh, path every day. Now, let's enter into the next part. Now, that is for the internal Holiness. If we understand the internal and we produce what God is saying in his word to keep ourselves in our, in, in the, our words, in our actions, in the thoughts and producing of the fruit of the spirit, then that means, beloved brethren, that we can become to be strong in the Lord. Because you know what? The more we humble ourselves to the word of God, the more that, that we humble ourselves, the more that God will lift us up. The more that God will show of his power and glory to our lives, the more we will give place that Jesus Christ shine through in our lives to reach many, many souls. Praise be the name of Jesus. Now, let's go to the external holiness. Now for this, let's go to the next slide. Glory to the Lord. Let's commence with the men in the external holiness. When someone is asking, as we saw, like the thoughts that are connected to God, even when they are going to go cut their hair, when they go get a haircut, they're going to look after how they cut their hair. They won't go get styles that are after the world or styles like in these days and times where there are people who come out with all sorts of uh, letters and signs and names and tags on their heads because they get it raised in there. Or some on their beards, they do zigzags, a W or an M or a lightning bolt or um, many things that it might be. But those things are not for a Christian, beloved brethren. That is why we need to understand that. And we're going to look at biblical scripture. So we need to look after ourselves in our, in our, on our heads and also on the beards. Blessed be the Lord. Because also it's very bad to see someone who's got a long beard and at the same time they've got painting there because they've, they've painted it the, or they've got 
um, you know, they've done it in braids and stuff like that. That's not of a Christian. Because if, if, uh, if we get to, you know, pray to the Lord, he won't say to us, yes, grow your beard and make it into broids. He won't say that to us. Because God is holy and he wants his people to be holy. So those who have the spirit of God, God will speak to them. If we get into God, into it with God, God will speak to us. He will correct us. Look, how? who knows how would I would have come here this weekend or last weekend. Because I was walking in the Bentley Plaza and uh, a man came up to me and he goes, you want to be a model for us to get a haircut, free haircut and you know, for the new business. And I said, no, thank you. I cut my hair already. And even if I wouldn't have cut my hair soon, I would have said no, because if, if I would have been modeling there, he would have cut my hair how he wanted. And then how am I going to present myself here? I might have had to have covered my head. So we need to be careful because sometimes people go to those places. And if we're not careful, then they cut our hair in a specific way. And they think that that's the way that we wanted it. Because remember that most of those people are not Christian and they go after what the the model is. And I'm always looking as well that, you know, they don't do any zigzags and things like that on my hair. Because you see that everywhere. And that's the world. So let us look after ourselves from all those things. Because many times, sadly, when we go to get a haircut or or something, then... Many of those people who work there are not Christian people. And so they follow the they follow the, the, the styles of the world. The way the rest of the world is doing it, they will do it. So if the world is doing half your head cut off and half not, then that's the way they'll do it. Now, when we go to short hair in the women, short hair in the woman, that is to say, when someone is cutting their hair, and it is less than what would be the shoulders. For a woman, something that is less than the shoulders, let's look at that in the word. You know why we show all this? Because we need to align our lives to what is written in the scripture. If it was not written, then I'll say, Amen, sister, no problem. But if it's written, then we need to write, then we need to follow it because this is what God wants us to know, what He wants us to follow. So let's go to the next slide. So that is the people of the world. Now, Leviticus chapter 19, verse 27, it says, Ye shall not round the corners of your heads, neither shalt thou mar the corners of thy beard. So he's speaking to the men here. And he was saying to them, what I was talking before, that we cannot start to... Uh, where it says you shall not round the corners. That means that we'll have specific type of styles. You might remember how the old, um, in the old time, the Catholic monks used to, or the Catholic priests used to uh, cut their hair, where they used to have hair on the top, which was round, but they would shave off to the very scalp all of the sides. Do you remember that haircut? And they had a specific style, which was the uh, Catholic priests. Speaking about many years ago, they would cut all of this off. They would shave it all off and you could see their, their head, bald head. But then at the top, they had a round part of hair. And that was the style that they used to have. But the Bible tells us clearly, you shall not round the corners of your heads, neither shalt thou mar the corners of thy beard. So it's not permitted either to do any sort of things that we've spoken already about styles on your beards or zigzags or names or tags or any of that. So God gives us the clear indication how he wants his people to be, how we should be. Let's look at the next um, biblical scripture as we still have many things to look at. Now, it says, referring to the men, Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? So that's a question that Paul, the apostle, was making. He says, does not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it's a shame unto him? So have you seen men who have their hair, that they let their hair grow to, to their backside? 
and it reaches to here and they have it like a woman that sometimes people look at them and they say well is that a man or a woman and that is a dishonor it's shameful the word of god says that to us it's not me who's saying it i'm just repeating what the word of god says that it's it's not it's not good so that's why in a church brethren there has to be norms established why because the Bible gives us an explanation of what it is saying. But if we don't apply the norms in the church, for example, then we have to say to the sister, to the lady, look, keep yourself from cutting your hair less than your shoulders. And if it's a man, we say to the man, look, keep yourself from letting your hair grow over your uh, longer than your shoulders. And if those norms are not established and like that in a church, then people start to go astray bit by bit because what might be okay for one person is not okay for another person. And so therefore, we have an imbalance of, of a belief and not thinking in the same mind, in the same spirit. So the next person will allow themselves to grow their hair even more and the next man will allow himself to grow it to his waist and the next one to, his, to the ground. And that's why we need to have norms in the church so that we can obey the word of God. And that's why in a church there is a good practice of what we've read in the Bible that the men do not allow their hair to grow longer than what would be their shoulders. Because after that it becomes to be shameful as what the word of God is saying. And just like that for a woman who cuts her hair less than her shoulders, then shorter than her shoulders, then it's also... It's also not good. Let's look at that verse. But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. You see, so it's talking in a woman that she should have long hair. So this particular verse here, there's a, there's a big study out of all this. In this particular verse, because in the old times, the women used to put on a veil. But um, there are some, some Middle Eastern cultures, Middle uh, cultures that still do it but in the western cultures we don't put the veils on but when we're talking about the hair yes those things are still for this time that we need to practice and so still when we talk about the hair it still remains that that that, that is still for the women and what is for the men is for the men now this is why i mentioned the norms because i'm not going to because there's a woman that might say, well, I'm going to let my hair grow and I'll never cut it and then it'll be on the ground. But that also is not correct. Why? Because there are some women that, yes, they they don't, their hair doesn't grow so quick, but there are other women that their hair grows real quick and if they're not careful, then they'll be dragging it on the floor. And that's also necessary for them to cut it a bit so that it's not so long. But that is then, how how should I cut it? That's between you and God. But at the same time, you need to ensure that it's not too short because of what the Word of God says. And so we're not going to be so strict on that either. But let's go to what is written in the Scripture. And we also establish those norms so that the people don't start to go astray bit by bit. Because this person will say, no, it's okay. The other person will say, no, but a little bit more. And the other person, but that's how the devil gets in, bit by bit. He starts to cause people to go in a, in a worldly and fleshly manner. And that's why we need to have those norms because of the word of God. And we need to establish that in the church. And that's why we have those norms. Glory to God. Now, that was about the hair. But now, let's look at something else which is also written. Let's go to the next slide. Glory to God. Here it says in 1 Timothy where we started, chapter 2, verse 9. Let's look at another part on this verse. It says, you see where it mentions that the, in like manner that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety. That's talking about the clothing. But now let's focus on the part of the hair. It says, not with broided hair. So let's focus on this, not with broided hair. What is a broided hair style? Well, to have broids or braiding your hair, it becomes to be something that is uh, of a style, a uh, worldly type of style. There are some styles, not just the braided, but there are some other styles as well, which are worldly. Whereas, for example, in a woman, they might shave off all of their hair on one side, and you can see this, this their head. And then on the other side, they got hair and they bring it down over their eye. 
So these are types of styles which are worldly styles, but not for a Christian. There are some women who may have long hair, but they'll make all different types of styles out of their hair. So they'll make a, a big sort of like a cone sticking out of their hair on one side, um, or they'll others will do different types of shapes and sizes and things like that, and objects like an animal shape and things. So those things exist. There are people that do that, but those are types of styles that are worldly styles. It's not for someone who is a Christian, someone according to what the Bible says in a woman and how she should be. But it is someone who wants to draw attraction or draw attention to themselves. And that's why that is worldly, but it's not of for a Christian. For example, in a men, there are men who buy, uh, purchase, you know, strong gel and they, they stretch out their hair into spikes like a punk. That's a punk style. And so those are things that are of the world, but it's not for Christians. So those are the types of styles that we need to be aware of that we do not follow in the styles of the world. Let's continue. When we go back as early as Egypt, because Egypt was a very ancient empire. When we go to the ancient empire, we see there that there were some uh, hairstyles which were also considered as uh, worldly. When we see in uh, Africans as well, they uh, also have braided hair styles. In the Egyptians, we also saw that they also have it. But when we look at see these figures, we see that there are these types of styles. And this is a tradition, a custom that has now come, which commenced in Egypt, very, very ancient. But we also see if you do an investigation, don't believe me, but you do it for yourself, the investigation, because there's there's many things to look at here, but there's a short amount of time. So when we have a look at these types of styles, the reason why I'm showing them is because there is a clear reason why the Bible mentions that we should not, women should not have this. And even men, because they do the broidered style as well. Look on the bottom image, that's Vikings who used to have their hair as women and they used to do the braided hairstyles. Coming a bit more modern, we'll have a look here on the left on this woman. She's got that braided uh, hairstyle. Now, this actually makes your hair fall out over time because there's damage to the scalp that is done. Damage to the skull. So when we look at this, can it, can it actually cause damage to the scalp of the head? Can it actually damage it? Well, look at it, investigate it, and you will find that it does cause damage. Let's look at this supermodel. Uh, this supermodel that when she began on the top left there, her career, there she is, and then on the bottom left as well, you can see there that after many years of doing braided hairstyles, um, in about 2012, the year 2012, they took these images on the right hand side where this woman was 42 years old at that time. And now look at her scalp of her hair. Now we're talking about a woman who was a supermodel who had a lot of money. But look at the results. Look at the results because of the styles of hair. The Bible explains to us for a, for a certain reason. Even though sometimes people might not understand it completely, but it's best to obey the Bible because this woman has a lot of money. But what? She cannot get her hair fixed because it's been damaged already. She, it won't grow. And she, at that time, she was 42 years of age. Imagine how much more hair loss now. So let's look at something else that is about holiness in regards to what we eat. Let's, let's leave the hair aside. In Acts chapter 15, verse 28 and 29 says, For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost. To who? To the Holy Spirit of God. So these men didn't just write down and do what they wanted. They got into fasting and prayer and asked God for his guidance. And God, it seemed good to God, uh, to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. What things? Let's look. That you abstain. Stay away from meats, that's foods. Foods that are offered 
to idols. So if you're going to eat something and you know that somebody who, who made it and they tell you that they have prepared it and they offered it unto their God, then you and they and they bring it to you, then no, you cannot eat that. Because in your conscience, you know that it's been sacrificed to the idols or um, people. And, and it says, and from blood. So those of you who like to have, you know, uh, a blood, uh, blood red steak. No, you cannot have a blood red steak because you cannot eat blood because the Bible teaches us that the life of the animal is in its blood. And so it's prohibited for us as Christians to eat those things. And you can't even be praying for that and say, God bless it. No, because the Bible clearly says you're seeing it right there that the blood is pouring out of the meat that you're going to eat. No, you cannot eat it. So it's better to tell the person to, to keep cooking that, that food until the old blood is gone. And it says also, and from things that are strangled, we cannot eat things that have been strangled. And from fornication, which is um, a physical fornication, which is an, uh, a work. And it says, from which if you keep yourselves, you shall do well. Fare ye well. So those are things about holiness as well for a Christian that we need to be aware of, of things that we should keep ourselves away from. Now. Let's look at this other part. For the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty and the drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags. Now this is speaking about someone who has a problem with gluttony. Let's look at that. Someone who doesn't eat because of uh, being hungry, but someone who eats because they like the taste of the food and they eat in a way that they don't control themselves and they don't really have any good manners when they come to eat. We're talking to Christians here because people out in the world, they'll do anything and everything. But, you know, they're walking in a path that is very wide, but God wants us to walk in this narrow path because as a Christian, God teaches us to discipline ourselves. Let's look at this next verse about the glutton. Look at what would happen in the Old Testament for someone who was a drunkard and someone who was a glutton. Let's have a look. It says, And they shall say unto the elders of his city, This is our son. This our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Look, in the old times, the parents had to bring their child out and bring him to the elders. To judge this case because their son was found to be a stubborn and rebellious because he was a glutton and he was drunker. But then it says, And all the men of his city shall stone him with stones that he die. So shalt thou put evil away from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. Look how tremendous that was, that the parents had to go and hand in their son and say, This, this, this of my son is, is a gluttonous person. He doesn't want to listen. He doesn't want to have good principles in his life. If that was like this in these times, whew, how many people would be not alive anymore? May God keep me because I would, have been died, I would have been dead so many times. But I thank God that I'm not the same anymore as I was before. I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. I'm, th I'm talking about what I was before. But I was dead before. I was dead in the spirit. But now I've been given life in the spirit by God for the praise and glory of his name. So these things are sin. And it's part of that we need to keep ourselves in holiness so watch yourselves from the buffet that if you're eating in a buffet and you've, you've hit that point where you're full don't continue because then it's sin glory to god let's continue hallelujah now let's touch on these other points now you might have noticed in the pictures in egypt where did that about painting lipstick makeup and all that come from you could see that even in history, even the men, they used to paint their eyes and, and they also used to pass it all the way to close to their temple. And all of that came from Egypt, brethren. And this is why the Lord tells us to keep ourselves from that, because we have examples even in the Bible, because Egypt represents sin, the world. And when we look at the people of Israel. Why did the people of Israel use it? They came out of Egypt. Remember, Egypt represents sin. They came out of sin, but they didn't bring the sin out of their heart. And that's why they would still practice it. Look, 2nd of Kings, chapter 9, verse 30. And when Jehu was come to Jezreel, 
Jezebel heard of it, and she painted her face and tied her hair and looked out at a window. So Jezebel was Ahab's um, wife. And Ahab was king over Israel, which was the king on the north of the ten tribes of Israel. But he went and married a pagan woman called Jezebel. And Jezebel would worship her pagan gods and come with her pagan practices, which is her devilish pagan practices. Manipulative woman she was. But it says that when Jezebel heard of it, that Jehu was coming, she painted her face and tired her hair. So she did one of those hairstyles to draw attraction, to draw her victim because she was a very manipulative woman. And it says, and looked out at a window. And so we see here that this woman in her mind already, she was trying to seduce her witchcrafts, her manipulations to use them to capture these men in lust and in, and in verse so that's where we see and she came and looked out at him through the window so you can read the rest of that story from that biblical verse if you want to to see what happened but let's continue jeremiah chapter 4 verse 30 what happened there and when thou art spoiled speaking to the people of the jews it says what will you do a question from god he was saying Though you clothe yourself with crimson, you, you who deck yourself with ornaments of gold, though thou rentest thy face with painting, yes? Yeah? So if you're putting on the painting on your face, in vain shall you make yourself fair. Thy lovers will despise you. They will seek your life. That's like saying, when God said to them, my protection goes from this nation. Now, what will you do? Even though you paint yourself, even though you prepare yourself before all of those other nations that you went and fornicated with. We're talking about that nation because remember that God would, would, would speak to the people of, of the Jewish nation, describing them as a nation like a woman and him as the husband. But because she went away fornicating with other nations and other gods, then God would say, I'm leaving you in this protection that I have over you. Now they're going to go and kill you. And even though you put on makeup and, and face painting and, and you tie yourself up or you try and seduce and do all those things, it will fail because they will seek your life. They will hate you. They will abhor you. Ezekiel chapter 23 verse 40. Ezekiel was one of the captives in the second captivity that they took away to uh, Babylon. And we see here it says, And furthermore, that you have sent for men to come from far, unto whom a messenger was sent. And lo, they came, for whom thou didst wash thyself, paintest thy eyes, and deckest thyself with ornaments. So those things, brethren, the Bible is talking about them in a in a way that this people spiritually was going astray and doing these things to draw attraction. So it's referring to it as an evil way. So therefore, it is not something that is correct to do. It is not something that God wants his people to be putting on. So Jude chapter 1 verse 23. Let's have a look now over what someone can put on someone can clothe themselves with so when somebody puts on their clothing in their clothing or, or what they wear you know they there's things that are transparent where they are showing their body parts those parts of the body which are an attraction the word of god says to us here and others save with fear pulling them out of the fire hating even the garment spotted by the flesh so when it speaks about the garment, the clothing that's spotted by the flesh, we will see that this has a double uh, meaning, the spiritual and the physical. In the spiritual, it means that when we practice the righteousness of God, then we are clothed with righteousness, the righteousness of God, and we are not found to be naked before God in shame and in sin because we've been justified by God. And that justification, the Bible in the book of Revelation mentions it as a clothing that is white, that clothing that is white because it's meant to be purity, meant to be true love, that agape love divine love and at the same time it represents the righteous acts the righteousness of the saints 
And that is why God mentions it in that way. But when we are talking about the physical, what is spotted by the flesh, there are people that dress in their clothing and show their body parts. And what am I referring to? Just quickly, let's just say, for example, in a woman that puts on something where you can start to see uh, that lining in between her breasts. And when that woman bows down or, or does a specific uh, posture, then you can basically see everything. So that is incorrect, brethren, especially inside a church as well as out there or in a dress, even though the dress might be long and it's and it's ripped on one side or on two sides, wherever it is. But if that dress starts to show above their knee and we start to see their thigh, those parts, brethren, that are an attractive part for a man to a woman or a woman to a man, then that is incorrect because that is then a person who is being a stumbling block because the enemy starts to then work in the mind of other people and starts to put temptations in there. And so we need to look after ourselves and to protect each other as well, to not be a stumbling block to our brethren and at the same time to not be a stumbling block in our own self as well. And all this has to do with keeping our brothers in the state of holiness as well as our brethren, our, our men and women. Ephesians 5.27 says, referring to the church as a wife to Jesus Christ. It says that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Referring to like a woman who is well prepared, is with respect, and it's given us a, a, an indication of what God is looking for. Let us, we're almost finished. Now this is worldly. When somebody dresses in this way, this is a worldly way. This is not for a Christian woman. Where women wear a dress, when they sit down, you can see all the way to their um, uh, inside. And down the bottom there, where we see all the other pictures as well, where we can see you know, their, their, their stomach, or we can see the lining of their breasts, or we can see their backs, or we can see uh, up their thighs, all of those things. Even the, the, the wearing of the singlets where we're seeing all of their, you know, their arms up, their upper arms. And just like that with the men as well. These things are not acceptable as a Christian. Because when there is a carnal man in a church, what happens? Because in a church comes everything. Men, women, lesbian, homosexuals. But then don't say that, oh, look, this other woman came and touched me. Well, watch yourself. Don't be an object of seduction for somebody else. So let's continue. Now, a woman might say, okay, well, I'm going to put on the dress. But also, it needs to be how the Word of God says. Because it needs to be with humbleness, uh, shamefacedness. Uh, because it says here, look, uh, in the figure in the middle, when somebody is dressed in this way, where the dress is actually not covering the knees. When that person sits down, it's going to uncover their thigh. See, in this example on the top, we see that the woman who has a dress that's shorter, when she sits down, she's always trying to bring it down because it's, she's showing her, her inner thighs. But the one on the bottom, it's more honorable because it covers the knee. But at the same time, when she sits down, it's not showing her thighs and there's no problem there. So let's continue. Now, we just show here some examples only uh, where the dress is not so uh, tightly put on. Uh, we're not going to say, oh, look, it has to be all the way to the ground. No, the Holy Spirit speaks to you. you know, he'll, he'll tell you what it is, but we need to be sincere. And this is for everyone because nowadays we can be firm in the Lord. But what about tomorrow? So we need to mention these things and we need to look after ourselves because bit by bit, people are going to be doing the wrong thing. So that's why we need to show these things so that we can be clear about what we're showing. And if in future we need to give this study again, well, with all joy, we will give it because when there's new lives that come, we need to also teach them the word of God. We need to teach them the way that God wants. We need to teach them what the scripture says, because God also wants to bless them and help them get to the end as well. And this will avoid many problems along the way as well of being a, a sexual object to somebody else. 
So, 1 Thessalonians 5.22 says, Abstain from all appearance of evil. So, if those things are going to be an object of, object of sin or for somebody else to fall in sin or to desire you in the way that they should not, then we need to obey the word and abstain from all forms of evil. Let's continue. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9. Now we return here, but now we're going to focus on the bottom part. Just as the women and the men, we should adorn ourselves with modest apparel, shamefacedness and sobriety. But now we're going to focus on what it is. And there it is again in the in the um, description, as we had mentioned before, how we should keep ourselves. And that is so very important. But one other thing I want to mention because of the time, the tattoos, tattoos, painting on people, there are people, yes, that they've done and undone out there in the world. But when they come to the church, God will change us. What is the norm that we should have in a church? Should they continue to show their tattoos? No, because that is the shameful thing of the world. So are they going to pay to have them removed? Well, if they desire to do it, we're not going to stop them. That's their choice. But if they can't get it off, then cover it. Because that way you're not showing that shameful thing to the world. You're not showing that you're of the world. And you're not giving a bad example to other people. Because if that was done in the world, well, it was done already. We're still going to accept you as a brother or a sister, but cover up. Blessed be the Lord. And that's what it is. Because so that we don't give bad example, because somebody else might come for the first time and says, oh, that's a Christian. Oh, then I can do a, a tattoo as well. And then somebody else comes and the next day they have a tattoo on. Brother, what are you doing? Oh, no, because I saw that that person has it. So I thought that it was OK. And who is the stumbling block there? The person who's up the front. That's why we need to keep ourselves and give good testimony in all these areas. Because we need to show that love and we need to protect our brethren and not be a stumbling block for anyone. Praise be the name of the Lord. In 1 Peter 3.3 3, it says... And of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel. You see... Let's focus of the gold and putting on of apparel, the ornaments of gold or silver or diamonds, whatever it might be. When we see the word of God that tells us, Paul also says it. And Paul established in the churches that were the Gentile churches, not just for the Jews, but it says in verse four, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit which is in the sight of God of a great price. So all of those beautiful diamonds and pearls, let it be of the internal man, of the internal spirit, of someone who is humble, someone who is... And that, you know what's going to happen? God will see it as something of a great price. And this means that God will give more grace to the humble. He will bless them even more. Because God is the judge and He judges in the midst of His people. Praise be the Lord.